The following interview was conducted with Professor Donald Gustafson, the uh, Leo P. Doyle Professor Emeritus of Veterinary Virology for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, June 25th, 2009 at his residence. This is part two of the interview. Welcome, good afternoon, and we'll pick up from there well, with their research. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, um, we are going to talk about now, we're going to talk about uh, uh, research activity. And uh, when I first came here, I uh, worked with uh, Harold Moses, who was, had moved here from Harvard. He was at the Huntington Laboratories working with the Newcastle disease. And because uh, this can infect human beings as well. And um, I, I started working with uh, uh, Newcastle disease in poultry. And uh, I found out that uh, one of our, my first publication was uh, a human infection. One of the fellows in the lab got a uh, uh, viral infection and Newcastle disease in his eye. And it just, uh, he got all red and runny and like that. And later on he had Bell's palsy. I didn't ever know what, the, if there had been a connection. It probably could be because there it, it's a neurological uh, disease. Anyhow, that was my f first uh, publication, and I, and I loved it. But I had to write it for Harold Moses. I don't know how many times. He was a taskmaster. He was uh, he was a wonderful guy. He gave me credit for every little thing I ever did. He never glommed on to my work. Great guy, but he could never finish a god darn thing. I'll bet he left us half of his meal on a plate because he couldn't be able to finish that either. But that was his biggest trouble. But he was very bright. And uh, he's a very good worker. But he did not recognize his own limitations uh, sometimes. And uh, I had to, I had to bear up with that. And finally, one time, when I was, I was so exasperated because I'd written this, written my thesis over and over and over again. Was she your major prof? Well, yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, he said, uh, I, I, he, my thesis was on his desk, and I'd go in there day after day after day looking to see if it's going, because I had this terrible um, concern that I didn't want to blow him up and get him mad. But I, finally, one day I said, Harold, are you going to ever sign that thing? He had to sign it. He said, you don't think I'm going to sign something I haven't read? And that's when, I, that, that did it. I, <laughs> I told him how many times we'd been over. This was the ninth version of it, and he'd been over every inch of this thing. And uh, he said, Oh sure, well I'll sign it, and he just signed it right off. I do like what the heck? Let's, what else is new? Let's have some coffee or something. God, I mean that cost me three hundred dollars to I had to because I had to sign up for another semester and I had to pay rent and I. But I, well, it cost me what I thought was a lot of money at the time. But um, I learned. Uh, what a what a really an honorable person he was. He's really he's great. deceased, is he? Is hmm? he is he deceased? Oh, he, he double dead. He fell off a couch and uh, just his heart gave out over in Ohio, for visiting relatives. That was wonderful because he just jumped over. I don't know whatever happened to Lucille. Do you? I didn't I didn't know Professor Moses. I, I don't even okay. recognize his name. Why huh? did she live here for a while? Oh she, yeah, yeah. She, they they had they had four children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So after that, uh, I developed a an indirect uh, uh, hemagglutination test for for uh, Newcastle disease, which they used in the laboratories here. I never published that. 
but I did, and I didn't think it was important at the time, but boy, it, uh, to those people, it was really great. They were using it over in the lab, and one day, you know, a, a girl over in that lab wanted to explain it to me. I thought that was delightful. Uh, nice touch. Yeah. <laughs> well, after that, then, I, I got into the hog collar business. Um, I had a friend at the uh, National Institutes of Health who came to see me one day and uh, wanted me to take a, to, it was one of the early days of grant writing. He wanted me to make a, turn in a proposal for work on hog cholera, which I did. And uh, I didn't know how much to ask for because I was such a greenie. And uh, he said, well, I asked for $10,000. That was back when, in the days when, you know, the, the the street out in the front of our building were the gravel. It was it was just plain old, and um, well, there were so many things of that sort that I can remember back in those days. But that's that's neither here nor there. But now we had when we were doing research with hog um I had uh, a couple of graduate students. Um, in order to house the pigs. We had to build our own houses. And then uh, that got to be ti so time consuming and, and labor in inefficient that I, I bought them for uh, uh, $60 a piece wooden houses to put the hogs in. And that's when we began to raise rats. <laughs> but the rats didn't ever just cause that disease. I put uh, the control house right in the middle and uh, other houses on either side, but we never had a a break. Well, that, I did a lot of hog collar work there, and and uh, did you get the, that grant? Oh yeah, oh yeah. My pal, he made sure that the, that I got it. And uh, uh, people at uh, Lilly and Company found out that I was doing some work with cholera, and they were just starting a biological enterprise down there, and so that I was became a consultant. At, Lily, and uh, uh, would that have been at the egg facility, which was down in Greenwood, Greenfield, Green, Greenfield rather? Yeah, okay. out of Greenfield, uh huh. And uh, that lasted for seventeen years, and uh, that didn't hurt my <laughs> income either. <laughs> that was nice, and um, so eventually, I developed the, I, what I think now. Now, of course, Albert Sabin was working in Cincinnati with cell culture derived virus for polio. And a guy up in Chicago said to me when I was working, because one of the things that I, that I, you just fill my mind with all kinds of memories. In order to, to work with the virus, you, you always had to have, the, the virus was in blood because you infect the animal and then, and then withdraw blood and the, the virus was in the blood. And that's how, and that's what they used for a vaccine, uh, serum and virus. The, the, take, the, take the serum and, and uh, antiserum. Not, there wasn't any virus in it but they used antiserum and recovered from recovered hogs for that. And then, the, but the virus that they inoculated was blood. Well, I worked with sows. And so with the help of a surgeon, John Bullard, um, we opened up the sows and, and her uterus had a whole bunch of pigs in it. Uh, it's called a pig bag in the in the packing houses, and we inoculated each one of those pigs with uh, the virus and then sewed her back up. And uh, oh, four or five days later, opened her up again, and then withdrew the amniotic fluid, the fluid that was around, and that was just loaded with the virus. And there I had, for the first time. That anybody had ever done it, virus in a fluid that was not blood. And so what? Well, so then I was able to uh, uh, 
grow the virus in cell culture. And that what I used was a uh, fluffy coat, the, the white cells. If you take a blood sample and, then, and uh, let it clot, you can, the, the first layer will be serum and the next layer will be a little skim of white blood cells sitting on top of the red cells down here. And you take that off and, that, and I put that in, in uh, uh, cell culture medium and it, those cells grew out and uh, the virus would grow in those. And eight years later, I carried that cell culture for eight years. I, uh, I found that the virus was there. It would immunize pigs, but they didn't get sick. So, voila, El Vaccino. <laughs> so I sold that to the Eli Lilly and Company. Uh, and they sold it to three other companies. And at one time, oh, more than 25% of the, all the hogs in the United States were vaccinated with my vaccine. And then I thought, boy, that's pretty good. <laughs> you get a patent? You, you hmm? get that patented or not? That's not good. Oh, you? well, they didn't want to take a patent out because they, they figured at that time, at least, um, they had such an advantage of being the first company out with a cell culture vaccine that was the and the Department of Agriculture, United States Department of Agriculture, compared it with all the vaccines, Chinese vaccine, the French vaccine. I don't think with the with the uh, Hungarian vaccine, but it was better than any of them. So. I had a pretty good uh, situation. Well, at any rate, the program was to eradicate hog cholera. And so the Department of Agriculture said, no live virus of any kind in my, and that was the end of my vaccine, it was stopped. Uh, well, cut off my income. <laughs> <laughs> a bit. <laughs> well, what came next then? So then I worked with well, I did that work with hog cholera, and then I started. There was um, how did that? Oh yeah, some guy up here near uh, Camden had some sick hogs, and there's a a veterinarian up there, a practicing veterinarian. And he drew our attention to that. And we went up there, and uh, that was my first experience with uh, pseudo-rabies, seeing these pigs, and it would even kill sows. It was that terrific. I mean, they didn't, a lot of them didn't recover. And the baby pigs were, were just, uh, they were gonna be gone, and so were the, all the pigs in between. So we found the virus in those, there's one story that, that stuck with me for a long time. This uh, this guy was on another, this veterinarian up here was on another farm and uh, he was, he cut open a dead hog that was, that was sick with pseudorabies and, um, or it was close to being dead and he killed it. And any rate, he took the, he, he flung a piece of liver to the dog and, and she had eight pups and he, and the farmer said, do you think you ought to throw it? You let the dog eat that stuff that comes from the pig that says it's sick? He says, well, if we get it, if it's sick, if the dogs get sick, well, then we'll know something more about it. And they did. They, the, 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 the dog, I don't know, what do you call a female dog? Uh, I don't know, whatever. Bitch. Yeah, bitch. bitch. Well, she died and so did her pups. All of them died. <laughs> And uh, they learned something about it. And but the farmer was such a nice guy. He just he he didn't bother. He didn't he didn't bother the veterinarian about that. No. <laughs> well, anyhow, um, that was our, our initial experience with that. And then so then I put it in in cell culture. Yeah. Uh, it'll grow in most anything. It'll grow on a wall. <laughs> it, well, anyhow. They grow in lots of different kinds of cells. 
And so we developed tests for it. And um, the detection of antibodies, the time of appearance, and um, then we did a skin test for it. That was suggested by some people out in Iowa or someplace. And I took it up to see if we couldn't use it as a, on a farm for us uh, to uh, monitor uh, recovered animals. And then to get rid of the disease, we would get rid of the ones that were serologically positive or, or were skin test positive. And we could uh, then save the ones that were still going and, and uh, and a guy could build his herd back up from that. But it didn't work out in the long run. It was too delicate. I tried lots of different places, to, but I, I couldn't get a steady go with that. So, then I, well then I, I did some work with antiviral chemicals to see what they would do in um, with pseudorabies. And uh, that had some promise, but I never did get to work that out. Uh, there were so many things that I, I wanted to do that I didn't have time to do. I never had time to do it. Um, And I, I fell in with the guys from the University of Pennsylvania, Bill Lawrence. He's dead now, but he was a great guy. How uh, was the um, sources for funding at that time? Were you getting some government funding or industry or Oh, both? I had... Because uh, you mentioned on your, your Vita that work that you'd done with some of the government agencies. I don't know if I ever had an NIH grant for that or not. Uh, I had some, but I got money from the Department of Agriculture. I got money from uh, uh, corporations. I never got anything from Purdue University. I was on my own. I paid for the people in my laboratory. And with the grant with, money? With NIH grants on, on Scrapey. You see, I worked with Scrapey for more than 20 years. That's a mad cow disease when yeah. in sheep. And uh, I, I had uh, money from them on, with Scrapey. And so I, I probably used some of that money to support work with, with pseudorabies uh, because I would be paying these people, be working on Scrapey and they, and uh, they would be able then, because I had them employed and I had money so they could do other things too. Sure. So, uh, I, it was, a, it was, um, it was interesting. I had, uh, I got a lot of money for Scrapey for the neurological diseases and stroke. They supported that. For years, yeah. But uh, some of the some of the techniques that were involved, like uh, I see here, uh, uh, the properties of defective interfering particles induced by photodynamic treatment on pseudorabies virus, because. Um, uh, We could uh, expose pseudorabies virus to uh, ultraviolet light. I don't remember. I don't remember what the heck how that went. Up. But that was uh, in the in the Indiana Academy of Sciences mm -hmm. that paper, and then. Um, 
uh, Steve Bolin, who's now up at the University of or up at Michigan State University, uh, the resistance of porcine pre-implantation embryos to pseudorbe because he and Lou Reynolds, who is, lives up here in Westminster now, uh, would uh, transplant embryos in swine. And that's where that came from. Mm -hmm. But I didn't do much with that. Now with Bill Lawrence, we did DNA fingerprinting as an epidemiological tool for the study of pseudorabies virus and infections. Um, I started to get I what I want to see some of the, these things are all intermeshed that um, uh, I provided the impetus and the arena and the people and the organization and for the first molecular virology studies that were made at, in uh, here at uh, in the veterinary school I went to a cell culture school in in uh, New York State, for example, uh, for out at uh, uh, not at Ithaca, but uh, Cornell, but one of the other Finger Lakes, where the Cooperstown, that's where the Baseball Hall of Fame is. Well, uh, we worked at the Mary Imogene Bassett Hospital in uh, Cooperstown, and that's where I learned uh, how to do cell culture. Well, I brought cell culture to Purdue. I did the first bit of cell culture that was ever done here, but who cares? But I did. That's nice. That's okay. Uh, Researchers will care. I mean, I was pleased with that. Right. And I said, I, I told um, the director, because at that time, uh, we, I was sort of, we were still in the, in the School of Agriculture, but you hadn't started the veterinary school yet. Yeah. Because I was here from for ten years before they started the school. In '59, it opened in '59. Yeah. School. Right. Well, I started January the first of '49. Mm -hmm. The first day I got paid. And uh, <laughs> so I had to talk to the director of the agricultural experiment station to tell him what I was, what I wanted to do, and when when I came back. And I, I told him, I uh, showed him what we could do with cell culture. And it was, it was like talking to a, a, a box of hoe handles, you know? <laughs> box of rocks, right? Hmm? A box of rocks. Yeah, that's right. He didn't get it. So I, I just looked out the window. So that came to... Uh, fruition later on, but mm -hmm. I won't. We won't talk about that. Okay. <laughs> well, I've had several papers on on the skin test because we were trying to make that thing go, but it didn't go. Mm -hmm. And there's a few more of them here that I was uh, photodynamic interactivation of pseudorabies virus with methylene blue dye, light and electricity. Uh, and uh, Janine Siebert was the uh, she was very much involved in that. In fact, this she was senior author in that paper. And Gail Sherba, who's now a professor at the University of Illinois, uh, in their diagnostic. And then uh, well, I, I just I did a lot of work with pseudorabies. Yes, you did, because I remember doing some literature searches for that too. Oh, uh huh. Sure. So I remember your work in that area. Anyway. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, I worked with the people at the University of Illinois. Bob Crandall and I wrote a paper. He's went to Texas. I don't know whether where he's even alive now or not. Then David Thawley, who became dean at Minnesota, oh, we, uh, and uh, John Murray, who was at Iowa State, and then later at uh, Arizona State. 
we did uh, put some papers together about pseudo rabies, and then with uh, a, a a guy at the U University of California at Los Angeles, UCLA, um, Jack Stevens, who was a veterinarian out there, and he was head of the Department of Microbiology in their medical school, and. Um, Um, he she was his graduate student and and we had the pigs and they had the idea and they did the, the real work out there but uh, we had to do some work here with in this in pigs and she came here and she was very good and her father was a microbiologist somewhere as well and um, so I worked with people there in Southern California at the UCLA, and then with people at Arizona State, and guys that went to Minnesota, and Bob Crandall, and uh, Steve Moulin is up there, and John Turek. He, he's he's something over here now. He's associate dean or something. At, and um, um, over in the school, in the veterinary school. Uh huh. And uh, Roger Moss and Chuck Connitz, all those people, they were, they were great. Well, that's, that's what I did. That did was, you ever get any, uh, anything get patented? Or did you get, have, ever have any patents? Well, I, I, yeah, I, I, no. I never did get a patent. I, I started to get a patent on a, on a little device to put... Um, protein which would b provide um, well at any rate this device was to put some this stuff up their nose or some other or s other openings in the animal body And it would put a spray out, and it was a very simple thing, sort of like a, you know, like a paper clip. How wouldn't you like to have invented a paper clip? Well, this was that simple. The piece of plastic, but we had little holes all over, it. and uh, it would not hurt the, the the nasal passages at all in itself. But we would go like with a sy syringe and a, a loose tube to go get to it and put that instrument up their schnoz and deliver the, the uh, measured amount of material. That we did with people from a company in Boston. The guy was a, who was the, pre the director of that thing, or president, or whatever. He was a Nobel Prize winner. And I had two ladies come out here. And uh, they were involved in molecular biology. And they were really bright girls. And you fell off of there, did you, Dumbo? <laughs> See how dumb he is? And uh, we tried that in cattle against a uh, herpes virus in cattle. I've forgotten so much. God almighty. I, I have to read this in order to get a hint. Sure. Of what I did, and I don't. That's good. That's okay. Yeah. Twenty-one years I've been out of that school. Doesn't seem that long though. Some days I'm sure. What about the school itself? That's gr grown. Old. Any challenge? It, how it's changed over time? Any comments on the school? Well, I I really shouldn't make any comment about the school because I haven't been okay. over there. But the en well, the enrollment sort of still stays the same. 
pretty much. You don't have more than, what, 60 some odd students? Oh, and the applications, yeah. I guess, have really increased. Uh -huh. for, well, well, for all the vet schools and medical schools as well, huh. you know. Well, I suppose. But anyhow, uh, insofar as the school is concerned, uh, I did stay over there long enough to get the, the, the uh, impression that uh, I didn't fit anymore. When did you retire? 1988. <laughs> 21 years. Which brings me to my next comment after that is, what, has, what have you been doing in retirement? Oh, I've been having a good time. Okay. Um, I didn't have a good time for, t for several years. I had a bad time because Lois was sick. After and you retired, she became yeah, ill? Yeah, and, and I, got, I had uh, uh, colon cancer. And I, that's the reason my stomach sticks out here because he didn't tie me off very, very well, the, the muscles, when he would put me back together again. Uh, cleared down from here, clear up to here. There's a big old scar, and s and there's four big retention suture holes along the side, and then I had the a stoma, my intestine <laughs> into a bag for three months, and then he put me back together again, and uh, not a pleasant experience. So those for those years, right. And see, now I had that the, the first year after I got after I retired, and uh, I, so that was the last year that I worked in the football stadium. I was supervisor in the press box. Oh, okay. And uh, you must have known. Did you know Johnny DeCamp? Oh boy, I did. I know John DeCamp. I knew him like he didn't want me to know him. <laughs> he was a funny fellow peculiar fellow. But at um, any rate, uh, then the, uh, in the next, then I, I, I got cancer again and I got over that one and uh, surgically. And I, was, I wasn't feeling too hot during those years. <laughs> and then Lois got sick. She had colon cancer and breast cancer, and and uh, she died in 1998 on August the 6th in the morning, right in there, and uh, in the living room. Had a bed in there for her. And uh, so right up to that was 1998. 10 years later. So the first 10 years of my 21 years were not particularly joyful years. No. A lot going, a lot going on. Uh, and so then I decided I wanted to get away from veterinary medicine, as a matter of fact, because my whole life had been spent churning up the, the, the mud between here and over there and back and around the world. Because I I took Lois when I had a, a trip with a, from the Office of the International Cooperative Development um, to Hungary because they had had, in, with pseudorabies, vaccination in sheep. There, there had been a leak so that there had been um, modified virus, attenuated virus, is only attenuated when when there's was one gene involved, and if 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 that gene is replaced, then you're back in the saddle again. Well, it, it had been transmitted, the the vaccine virus had been transmitted to sheep from pigs and the sheep started dying. Well, that was a deep concern that uh, 
A replacement can be made. It's sort of like the old uh, recognition that if a reaction can go one way, it can also go the other way. Sure. And uh, that's the basics. And, and, uh, so I persuaded them that it would be a good idea to somebody to go over there and visit. And they said, when are you leaving? <laughs> So I went over there with another guy from Iowa State, George Barron, and uh, I took Lois with me. And uh, well, we went around Switzerland first. And that was a joyous trip, and then we got on the plane at uh, we got on the plane. It was a it was a Hungarian play. We were going behind the Iron Curtain, and the guy asked me because I met the attaché in Washington, and he said, "Or does it give you a, any real concern about going behind the Iron Curtain?" And I said, "Well, should I have it?" And uh, he didn't answer me, but so, so that ended that, and, and we went, and uh, we got over there, and. Uh, had a good time. We went to we went to the uh, a musical uh, thing that was really great, and uh, uh, some other stuff. And and there's lots of uh, went sightseeing. And and our host, um, Naj N A G Y, that's pronounced Naj over there. Uh, Nagy here. There was a guy in the staff named Nagy. If you remember, do you know him? Yeah, yeah. Well, his name, I, I saw, met him at, at a football uh, luncheon one day, and I said, you know, your name is really Naj. And he said, I know it. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, he took us out in the field, out to little towns, and there was Lenin, statues of him. And, uh, I, well, I was impressed by all that yeah. stuff. Oh, yeah. And uh, we... He wouldn't talk in the car. He was driving. When we got out and, and we're in the woods, well, he'd talk to us, but he wouldn't talk to us. And Just better out in the field, <laughs> a little way. more open. Yeah. Well, there wasn't a, there wasn't bugged. Everything was being recorded in that car, no, no doubt. I I didn't. I was a greenie. I was naive. I didn't think that they would do <laughs> such a dumb thing. <laughs> well, anyhow. <laughs> I, I I traveled a lot, uh -huh. and that was with uh, that was a, a real interesting trip. When I got over there, uh, the the uh, I met the fellow who developed the the pigeon vaccine. Seven hundred sixty three passes through chicken or from through uh, pigeons, or something. I don't know five hundred maybe. At any rate, I met him, and, and the, the guy who uh, had been my contact to start with, he was um, kind of aggravated. He didn't like me very much. I'd met him here in the States. At, He's the uh, one that invited you to come over? I'm not sure. I don't think so. Okay. But he was involved in the project over there. Oh, yes. Yeah. He denied that there had been any transmission. He said, if that were to occur, he said, I'd be in big trouble. So we had to take it from there. That there wasn't any of this kind of stuff. And so we'd had a, we went out to farms and visited farms, and, and there was a, they were, they were really nice to us. One guy had just made some peach brandy and he opened a bottle very pridefully. And George, he said he can't not stand to even come close to alcohol because he gets all red in the face and all like this stuff. And, and, and the, the, well, I mean, to, to not drink the, this guy's peach brandy would have been a, probably, he wouldn't have enjoyed that. And um, Not my homemade brew. <laughs> no. And George just took a little sip of that, and he didn't have any more. I had the peach brandy. I thought it was great, but I could, I didn't want to 
have more, <laughs> you know. So we we dumped that one. And then there was a there was a couple there, and the, and the wife, and she and uh, on the farm where you were visiting. On the, is this on the farm? No, this was she was in the lab. Oh, in the laboratories. She was a, a striking woman, and she struck George. And uh, if if she wouldn't, her husband would have. <laughs> But George really took to her, because she was she was just like a picture, you know. She was, the, the, the Hungarians have some very beautiful people. Yeah. Both men and women are, are very handsome people. <laughs> and, and well, anyhow, um, and we went out on Lake Baikal. Oh yes, yep. and it's only fifteen feet deep. I've heard about that. Yeah. Bakal or something like B A. It's an odd spelling, but that's a yeah. B A I K A L. Right. Yeah. It's very well known. Uh huh. Well, we went out to that. We were going to go across it, but we couldn't make it because of uh, when uh, uh, Naj went up to to get the up to that tree up there to to get our tickets. Uh, something happened that we couldn't go. The boat wasn't going to go, or anyway, we didn't go. <laughs> we never knew what. Why. And George was, he was trying to d develop a, a program back and forth, you know. Uh, he wanted to come back and so he said, you'd come back, wouldn't you? And I said, I don't want to come back. I just, I said, George, you know why we're here? I said, we're here because there was a transmission of vaccinated animals to a to virulent virus in, in, another, in another species. That's why we're here. I had to explain it to him. Because he was, he was a free soul. Right. He's a great guy, but he, a lot, he was expecting a lot of exchange back and forth. <laughs> oh. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't. I didn't see that. Anyway, we went to Naja's home, and we, we, it was explained to us why, and uh, uh, Naj was there. And but then with that, the relationship they had with their with a. Uh, government and we went into the great big building you know you see on the Danube that big ag building went up in there and uh, walked down those majestic halls and into a, an office uh, uh, that was uh, well the office was very was like about as big as our library in the veterinary school and there was a picture behind the guy's desk of Lenin and uh, I, and Naj sat over there, and he translated what this guy was saying. And uh, we went into a a, a, a big uh, market downtown, and because this guy told me that they did not slaughter any animals under 160 pounds. And so we went down there, and they had all these carcasses hanging up and down. And I looked at those things, and I said, George, those things didn't weigh 160 pounds. Those things they weighed about 125 pounds. George wasn't interested. Well, I never understood that. But at any rate, that was a trip to, on pseudo rabies to one of the trips we made. And we went out to Taiwan and that was something too on pseudorabies and hog cholera because they were still making rabbit vaccine and I, I told them I said you guys are better than that you don't want to be inoculating rabbits and harvesting livers and kidneys and mashing them up and taking that stuff out and uh, making vaccine out of that I said the, the way, you're no better than that to grow it in cell culture. And uh, there was this guy from uh, Cornell along, Ben Sheffy. His name was Chef Chick, but he changed it to Ben Sheffy. 
he was a very very nice fellow I liked him very much but he got he got all upset he got all uh, at, at me because I had told him about this stuff and he wanted I mean we had a, a big square table in that one of the last mornings we were there and he uh, got after me about this and I decided immediately that this was not the arena for that kind of a discussion so I didn't say a word Ben kept on with it I just sat there like Buddha and there were there was there were seven of us there from the United States mm -hmm. and um, the other guys all appreciated what I did but I didn't get into a contest with him at that particular point and I was invited back to Taiwan and they wanted me to come back and the, and the big the head man at the final meal he served my plate he wanted to do that and I, that meant a lot to him but it didn't mean a damn thing to me except I didn't get the right stuff they make at any rate then they had there was a meeting an international meeting at Iowa State and I went there and he was in these Chinese were there from Taiwan and I was invited to, to come back to uh, Taiwan to do something but I sent Chuck Connitz I can uh, Chuck loved to go he went he went on to Hong Kong and had a big time I guess <laughs> made it worth their while yeah 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 but that was that's something. Yeah. Well, but uh, I worked with chickens later on again um, with a guy from Lily and Company. But I only had I only had fifteen hundred bucks to do it. You can't do anything with fifteen hundred bucks except get yourself in trouble. And well, that didn't pan out. And it was the first time I ever raised my voice in anger at a a student, a graduate student. I had a Jewish boy there. Active. He was a good worker. Um, but he told me one day, he said that he was going to help teach a course for so-and-so that and I said, not while you're working for me, you're not going to. Not when I'm paying you your wages. I said, if he wants to pay it, that's fine. But, and then, but he started giving me a little guff, and that's when I shouted at him. And then I'd never raised my voice in the lab ever to anyone. <laughs> but I did that time. Jeez, that made me mad. Yeah, sometimes apparently those happen those things happen yeah, yeah but it was it was um, that has to do with this chicken business because then he started telling me about how he could uh, could have designed this thing a heck of a lot better oh. <laughs> and uh, uh, that that didn't go down well with me either because I'd like to see him do it on fifteen hundred bucks, <laughs> and um, I, I could told him I could too, but I can't do it for fifteen hundred dollars. Good for you. But th that's just a little anecdote about life in the laboratory. Right. But there was so much good. I had such a wonderful time, and and I was. Well, you read in here, that the, and I was. I, I read this thing, I think last night, and and um, to see all the things that I did, I was amazed. This kind of what bringing this sort of brings it to closure because it, in in overall, as you look back and yeah. your Vita represents all the work that you've done. Pretty much, yeah. Right. And, uh, for example, I went on a planning program team to the University of Wyoming on an arthropod-borne animal disease. 
There's a great story about that, I think. I mean, it's an interesting story. They were going to move it from Denver to the University of Wyoming at Laramie. Well, this arthropod, Midge, little Midge, that was uh, involved in the transmission of some disease that I don't remember, won't live in Laramie because Laramie is 7,000 feet above sea level. And the lab at, in, in the Denver area was much lower than that. It, it wasn't a mile high. It was much lower. It's in the Denver area, mm -hmm. but probably somewhere else. But it, but the, they couldn't grow the third thing up in Wyoming. You know where they did? You know what they did? They moved the lab to Wyoming, to, to Laramie, and put pressurized lab. Uh, <laughs> they wanted to go, and so they'll do whatever they can to get there, right? You betcha. Right. <laughs> but that was an interesting yeah, experience. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. Huh. Well, I, I did things like that, and then I went, I did another thing that I, I was amused by. Probably didn't amuse them a darn bit. But um, out at uh, the, the uh, laboratories at Harvard University, in which uh, they were outside of town, the pathology group, an, ex an experimental pathobiology, I guess. And uh, <laughs> these guys uh, out there were saying that they wanted to develop a, a, a relationship with Germany so that they would go over to Germany uh, annually for a bit. And I was on the team there to evaluate their activity. And uh, I took umbrance with the with the international horse manure. They didn't need to do that, and they didn't get to go either. I mean, NIH decided they didn't want to fund it. <laughs> I don't, but, but I don't think that they like that. Probably not. No. I did the same thing here with with a a, a physics. Physics guy and the head of ag biochemistry. I've forgotten his name. But we were sit the three of us who were sitting up there. I why I was invited to be a participant in this, I guess, was because I was a veterinarian and doing some research over here on who knows what cell culture probably. Uh, and I had been a, a student in in the biophysics uh, with this one guy who was really a nice guy. They were both fine people, um, but they were planning on having a, a, a meeting in London. <laughs> I said, why, why go to London? I said, if you're, if you're planning this meeting, why don't you have a rot chair? Rot chair in River City. That was the last meeting I was invited to. <laughs> I mean, we got we have some interesting people on this. That's right, campus exactly. Too. That's right, yeah. And uh, well, I was never really a tourist. We had tourists in the, in our school, guys that would go anywhere for anything. I I had I could have I could have spent time in North Africa. I could have gone to Kabul and and Karachi and all that stuff. I could have done that, or could have gone to Africa, or and I could have gone to Guayaquil and. On, uh, in Ecuador, but I could never justify any of those on, in my mind. The only ones I could justify were going to Sweden and <laughs> uh, hypocrisy in action. They call it. There you it. go. Right. Yeah. Well, there are, think, lot, there are I, lots of things that yeah. like that. But I think you had a, you really have shared a lot of information that the researchers will be able to benefit by. And when you get the transcript, you can add on if you want some other things. Okay. Okay. Good. I want to thank you very, very much. For oh, you're welcome. I'm sure.